So yeah, this is a joint work with Sagar and myself. Uh, quick background, Mintra is India's largest fashion e-commerce. I think uh, we cater to mass premium segment. And, uh, and I, I head the data sciences at Mintra. So if you have not seen, I think there's a lot of word embeddings and vector representation. I think that's a fundamental problem. I think can we capture efficient representations of style? Uh, of each, and by style, I mean a fashion product. And, and thankfully, the hypothesis for each of the presentations so far has been different. So uh, otherwise, it would have been like really boring if we keep repeating the same thing. But fundamentally, I think uh, I'll, I'll kind of spend a little bit of time motivating the hypothesis behind this, uh, how we go about capturing the vector representation for a style. right? And I'll just set the premise for this work. You know, I think, and very quickly, it's quite widely accepted, but uh, personalization is key for e-commerce company, right? And for, that, and for that matter, any internet company, personalization is key. I think two main points. One, from a demand perspective, you know, we have a single platform which caters to a tier one demographic versus a tier three demographics in India, right? So it, it's a wider and a diverse consumer states from a demand point, point of view. And from a supply point of view, I think, uh, two things. One, we are a mobile dom dom dominated, 80% of our traffic is mobile. And, and, and we have a really long tail of products, right? So this ratio of real estate versus product is really overwhelming. And to really effectively render this, you know, personalization is, is very critical, you know, so that we don't leakage, we don't leak visibility in some sense, right? So uh, matching supply demand, again, personalization is, is very critical, right? I'll just, and, and you know, to Obviously, to render personalization, it's very important that we understand the context in which a user is browsing or looking at a fashion portal, right? And the harder the context detection, uh, the less effective personalization is going to be, right? And, and just oblige me for a while, I'll just mention a, you know, that fashion is heavy semantics. I'll just go about it later. But uh, fashion in fashion domain, I think the context detection is a little bit more harder, and I'll, I'll explain that a little, bit, a little bit later. So with that premise, I think the objective is, uh, do you want to, we want to decode fashion context and identify the user need, so as to effectively render personalization for fashion e-commerce. I'll spend a little bit, uh, probably a minute, just talking about and comparing, comparing and contrasting fashion with other domains. You know, I think, uh, if you think about the definitely similarities with movies, music, and books, uh, there's a good mix of a strong personal choice and an element of social influence, right? So Netflix or Hunch or Spotify, those are places where you can look for learning how personalization is rendered. But at the same time, I think the fundamental differences in fashion, I think two points. One, one because styles, unlike movies or books, which are long lasting, uh, you know, fashion styles are ephemeral and fast changing. And we already touched upon some of these points. I'll just quickly highlight, uh, quickly go through it. And on that line, you know, freshness and diversity is very key for fashion business, right? You have to keep it fresh, you have to keep it changing. The second point, I think the fashion semantics, and I'll just explain it a little bit. You know, fashion, when we talk about a product, uh, a style, and a, a style is not complete in itself, right? You know, I think. Uh, what is missing is the look which is supporting the style, right? You know, when I look at a t-shirt, uh, the user is probably looking at a t-shirt in a from a completing a look point of view, which is implicit in the purchase in the browsing pattern, right? So there is a uh, some amount of implicit look which supports the style, and if you think about it, uh, the there is a almost like a layered representation of of how a style has to be rendered, right? There is some look, and the look is defined by you know fashion. Aesthetic, styling aesthetics, there is some amount of fashion ethos and personal traits all defining how, how a person wants to create a look, right? And he's never going to say, if I look at a t-shirt, am I buying the t-shirt because I want to ma ma match it with the jeans? Or I'm looking at a t-shirt because I'm wearing it, trying to match it with the chinos, or just oh, I want a blue t-shirt? So that's what I mean by heavy semantics in the sense there's a lot of uh, ambiguity around how a user is looking at a style, right? And very loosely speaking, I think this is a key motivation for the hypothesis in how we approached creating a vector or creating this word embeddings, right? So what it implies is a style can emerge in multiple contexts, right? The same product can cater to different looks and emerge in multiple contexts. So that's what we are trying to, uh, that's the crux of the work. Quickly, so a couple of other challenges in fashion. One, I think, again, we talked about this earlier. There isn't a 
you know, rich and a uniform taxonomy, right? You know, again, different across across the globe and even specific to India uh, domain, Indian uh, geographic, there isn't a taxonomy, right? What it means is the merchandise hierarchy, we have t-shirts and then we, then you've got the SKUs. There's nothing filling in between. So which makes, uh, you know, the merchandise hierarchy is too shallow and you cannot act at a, at a good meta layer. There is absence of that. Styles are ephemeral and what it means is that the signals are very sparse and, you know, your point estimates are always going to be unstable. Uh, one, again, user intent from sessions need not be cohesive. You know, there could be coherent sessions, incoherent sessions. And finally, the point I raised earlier, semantics, you need to establish style similarity with respect to specific context. I think those are the main challenges and we'll try to address uh, some of these in our approach, right? I think very quickly, you know, uh, the, this main overarching theme is establishing style similarity under different contexts. So if I ask this question, which ones are similar, you can say that probably A and B are similar from a visual point of view, but for a functional need, somebody is looking for cleats, A and C are going to be similar, right? So the same if, for example, and the, and the real use case is if, you know, A goes out of stock, what do I show to a user? Now I cannot, I'll show B if, in a, one context, I'll show C in another context. Right? That's what I'm trying to define, right? So how can we infer the consumer context, right? And one, the, the, you know, the hypothesis again is, you know, you can look at the product context, but in how it is being rend how it is being manifested in the user session. Like how, in what context is the user browsing the session? So if I look at the browse session, I see a lot of cleats, then I can infer, look, this is a functional use case, a functional proposition which the stylus trying to serve, right? But maybe in a different context, when it is not, it's all about just a look, you're looking for a casual look, in that session, you know, it's serving a different look. So this is the main hypothesis. Can I look at the session data, and can I create, uh, can I extract the context in which a style is, you know, uh, style is being browsed, right? And use that to establish style similarity, right? So if I look at typical approaches of similarity, you know, uh, what, what happens is you have the content or the attribute-based similarity, and you have the collaborative filtering-based item-item similarity using session data. I think pros and cons, one, I think content attribute is great because it translates style into the attribute space, which is, then becomes a long-lasting, right? It's not, like it kind of circumvents the uh, cold start problem and circumvents the you know, uh, ephemeral property of styles. But the negatives, you know, fundamentally, again, what is the weight you have to give it to an uh, attribute, right? Is, is stripes more important than color? Who is going to give you the weights in which an attribute have to be uh, grouped together, right? So that's one problem. Other is obviously typical clustering. You know, if I don't do, if I don't do prob probabilistic clustering, I think you're forcing styles to one, uh, one set, one group. So it again, uh, there's, and there's an absence of user context, right? So that's a problem with a uh, content-based approach. A collaborative filtering, you're looking at the session data, is does capture a user content, but then context, but then it has the cold start problem, right? You really cannot, uh, and given that styles, individual style level transaction uh, data is very sparse, you really don't get a good collaborative filtering approach. And often when you, typically what happens is you move very quickly into an item item graph partitioning approach, which again uh, forces it into one group and you don't have multiple context property, right? So what is the motivation for our approach? One, our approach tries to marry these two approaches. One, both look at both session and session defining the user need and the context in which a style has to be presented to the user and probably move it into the style attributes because style attribute will help you address the longevity of the inference, right? And the second point is capture styles to multiple context relationship. Those are the two main things which I want to, which this approach tries to address, right? And so a moment to talk about inspiration. I think inspiration is Similarity to natural languages, where there are similar challenges. You know, typically words emerge in multiple contexts, and words are substitutable only in specific contexts, right? And and what we have seen there is taxonomy approach is not scaling because the vocabulary is is increasing. And that's very very much like fashion. The vocabulary, or the number of styles are continuously increasing, and styles emerge in multiple contexts. And the approach we have taken is you know decoding you know the context from its usage. Uh, the cliche statement, you shall know a word by the company it keeps, right? And that's what I, what I showed there, right? You look at the session data and look at the company of, of styles uh, in which the user is looking at that particular product, right? So, so that brings to the point is word embeddings. What are word embeddings? Basically, uh, it's looking at a huge corpus of data. You capture the, uh, you know, capture the semantic distribution of those, of those attributes and then translate into a high dimension vector space, right? And that's what we are, what 
this what we are trying to do as well. I think uh, what we have is a rich sessions data. Right? We have like million, you know, typically in a day we have anywhere with 3.5 million sessions which are uh, which are there, right? So that means we have a large corpus of uh, of how styles and their attributes are being distributed across these sessions. So that's the key thing. Uh, there has been previous work on looking at word to word -work representation using style description as one document, right? You typically what you do is you take a style document and then train a doc to work or a word to work model, right? Now what we are fundamentally doing different is you look what the document is the context or the, the user session data, right? So that is my document. And I look at how attributes of those styles are distributed across the sessions. And you have millions of sessions of data, so that's the advantage this model has, right? You know, unlike a traditional uh, style-based word to doc where you will have just as many documents as the number of styles, this suddenly translates into you have as many sessions and sessions have semantic captures, sessions are able to capture the semantic distribution of attributes which comprise the style. So that's how it is, uh, it's kind of fundamentally different. And uh, yeah, so, so with that, I think that's just the uh, talk, get into how we actually go about doing it. Uh, can we learn, the question is, can we learn a vector representation of our sessions and contexts, right? So the approach is we, uh, we look at skip, skip gram based modeling. Uh, it's a Miklov paper. And again, what are we doing? A session is considered as a proxy to the context. And our approach attempts to uncover cohesive context from these sessions, right? So each style is first encoded into various attributes. And we look at attributes covering patterns, brands, price, length of dresses, and so on and so forth. And we also look at n-grams and bigrams from the product description document, right? So th all of those are my attributes. And then a, and a bag of word representation of each uh, style is, is, is created. And then the session is actually looking at the, all the attributes present observed in, in one session, right? So, and then we do a very, we train a word to work model, which is, and we use the uh, skip gram approach, now the SIBO approach, and, and try to learn vector representation of each attribute. So what you're getting is you look at the attribute, uh, semantic distribution of attributes learned from session data and create a vector representation of each attribute. That's the, that's the first step. Once you do that, then you're able to aggregate the attributes uh, aggregate the vector representation of all the attributes and create a vector representation for each style. So, and that creates your uh, style vector, right? Uh, so, uh, so that creates a session vector. Okay. Once you have created a session vector, then the next point is, can I create homogeneous user contexts? Which is basically saying that, look, I really want to create very cohesive session vectors, right? And create these product contexts or product groups, right, or user context. So what we do then is, you know, we cluster sessions. So again, this is slightly different. We are not moving into uh, the user space. We keep it at the, uh, at the session space. And we cluster sessions to form homogeneous groups. At this point, what we do is we want to ensure that these homogeneous uh, contexts so that uh, they are, you know, uh, they are coherent. We do have some coherency score. We kind of prune away non-coherent sessions basis, you know, what is the, you know, what is the minimum similarity of cosine similarity of each style in that session, right? So we look at some coherency score and prune away uh, non-coherent sessions, and then we kind of start clustering these user, uh, cluster, clustering these session vectors to carve out uh, co coherent product groups. Now the Advantage now is, this is where the last bit, now that I've moved into a uh, context representation, I also get the fact that look at, look, go back into history, history and see that which styles emerge in which context. And as a result, what you're getting now is style has a membership in multiple contexts because I never uh, moved away from the session data, right? I never went into an item item graph or, you know, I left it at the session vector and then I look at cohesive sessions and I say, look, a style has been observed in multiple sessions and there we, there are, and through that we're able to derive a fuzzy membership of a session in multiple clusters. And that's the key, the key bit of the work. This kind of addresses the two main objectives we went about. One, we are, we are able to move a style into a attribute space and we're able to capture style in, in multiple contexts, right? Now, a couple of good things I think on outcome is, you know, as a new session comes, I'm able to kind of map it to one of our uh, product groups. So this, even at a, there's no cold start problem at a session data because everything is eventually captured in attribute space. And when I observe a new 
new session. I'm able to look at all styles in that session, compute the attribute vectors, and compute a style vector. So as and as in when new sessions come in, I'm able to kind of create a session representation as well. As in a new style comes in, I'm able to capture it from a uh, translate into an attribute space and capture a style vector as well, right? So that's the fundamental uh, algorithm. Very quickly into the results, what we typically see is, you know, styles, and this, I think, again, we do multiple levels of clustering, you know, types, uh, this, this particular where we kind of group the entire product, uh, entire sessions into 100 product groups, and it yielded such a distribution, and on average, style belongs to 2.67 product groups, right? Then, then the final use case of it is, can we predict, predict real time, you know, what, uh, what the next product, given that a person is browsing a set of styles, can I predict which next style he's going to observe? This is the fundamental use case of recommendation engines, right? You know, if I've seen n number of styles, and this is where the context-aware recommendation, uh, this approach kind of uh, caters into a context-aware recommendation, because having observed the session and having observed he has clicked three or four items, can I predict the next item with high certainty? That's the obje final objective which you're going to solve. And the way we kind of go about doing it, you consider first n, min n minus one styles of a user session, and predict the product group for the nth style. So what we did is, uh, we'd start uh, training over 200,000 sessions we, uh, on one million users, and post that vector representation of each of the 200,000 sessions, we do some thresholding and create 100 product groups, right? Now we start with 100 product groups, and this is a simple KNN-based uh, approach algorithm, right? So what we do is keep 30K sessions with, which have not been observed, in the history, and we ensure that these 30K sessions are, are you know, have uniform distribution, uh, distribution across the coherency risk score. So we'll see high coherent sessions as well as low coherent sessions. While training for, you know, solving the imbalance problem, we do train it uh, with a high coherency kind of, uh, but the evaluation is always ensured, uh, always across all types of sessions, coherent or incoherent, right? And it's like top three kind of a classification. Uh, and the reason to three is, as I mentioned before, a typically average style is distributed on 2.67. So we say that, look, can I predict the top third, top three uh, product context in which uh, this user is going to, this product uh, is, the next product, the n nth product is going to be part of, right? And if it is, if it correctly predicts one of the top three, then you get a plus one, and if you're not, you get a minus one. And that's, that's the uh, basic uh, testing framework. And what we do is, you know, even for, for high coherency kind of scores, I think the accuracy is very high. And even with low coherency, it's typically 0.7%, 70%, even for noisy and non-coherent session. That's pretty much the main, main use case of main uh, use case of this approach. Uh, as a result, we also get a lot of other be benefits out of this, which are typical to any word to work kind of a, or a word embedding styles uh, representation. You can ask questions like, you know, look at attribute-based similarity, you know, looking at the cosine distance uh, in the semantic space. So you can look at, uh, you know, if it's cleats, going back to the, if it's cleats fixes the attribute, what are similar attributes? You'll say that, you know, it's a sports football or a stud uh, fastening asymmetric lace-up or similar attributes in that semantic space. If it's brand replay, which is a premium brand, then you gets brand scotch and soda, brand Calvin jeans, MRP, which is greater than, this is in rupees, and, and diesel, some of these are the close brands, right? So you can ask such questions. You can also talk about a brand proposition. What does a brand stand for? So this is a brand which is a uh, private label. And what does Dressberry stand for? And it stands for uh, dress lens is mini, it's knitted is the typical, uh, and polyester is fabric, round neck, polka is the pattern. These are the dominant pattern which uh, Dressberry, uh, you know, the, that's the proposition which Dressberry stands for. And some other close brands are, you know, similar brands from the same, you know, uh, house of brands. And you can ask questions like, given a style, what are the other similar styles? And Brook Brothers is a, is a query t-shirt, and you can observe that, you know, most of Brook Brothers, other t-shirts from the same brand, because Brook Brands is a premium, Brook Brothers is a premium brand, and also you see that some of the other brands are premium brands, like Nautica, Superdry, and, and so on and so forth, right? You can ask, given a session, what are the similar sessions, right? That's a goal. And, and you know, if I give a query session, which is, and this is, a, this is interesting because it's a new session which has not been observed, right? You can, and this is what I was saying, telling you earlier, like uh, it's a really cool start, even from a session's point of view is address, right? So if I give it a new session, basics, Avengers, and Jokers, you look at earlier product groups and 
tell me which whether it's a new one or if it's if, if I am able to find a session in the in the historical you know knowledge base of sessions then I'll surface that and and what it surfaces here is you know a graphic comic cons kind of uh, session is what this kind of uh, the user needs state in some sense right uh, given a style what are the various contexts it has membership to you know you query a uh, raw t-shirt and g-star raw t-shirt and it says let's look the two predominant contexts one with a 0 0.08 and 0 0.1 respectively and some of the attributes of that context are summarized here uh, basically context one talks about round neck t-shirts whereas context two is not so homogeneous it has both round and v-neck but at the same time context two is more coherent in terms of price bands right uh, all t-shirts in context one are short sleeves while context two is kind of distributed so context two is primarily a uh, MR, the pricing is the main context of, or the main proposition of that particular context, whereas context one is more on attributes, right? So attribute homogeneous, but not so much as price. Uh, so that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, conclusion, you know, we showed how skipgam based word to vec modeling can be used to project all attributes, styles, and sessions to high dimensional vector space using both the style attributes and the user's browsing signal. A point, one point is, you can take it to one more, one, one other feature is, each of these sessions are being generated from a user, right? So I can aggregate the session vectors and create a vector representation for a user as well. So that's the other benefit of this. Uh, although the only thing is uh, you might have to do a couple of uh, aggregations because currently each session vector is being learned for a one particular article type. So I create a session vector for say dresses, I create a session vector for, uh, for you know, t-shirts and so on and so forth, right? So uh, when, I when I aggregate, I create a session vector for that user article type kind of a uh, combination, but I can still aggregate and do one more aggregation and say that, look, this is the fashion, uh, you know, fashion vector for this user. By clustering, we're able to, you know, ensure more long lasting context and uh, projection to vector space, you know, allows this fuzzy membership of styles. And you can, you, we demonstrated how we can leverage those vectors to predict the current context of the user. That's, that's, that's pretty much it, what I had. Any questions? Quick. Thank you. So we're a little short on time, uh, so we'll just do one question. So if you think you have the best question about the talk, raise your hand. How about the second best question? <laughs> yes. I think this is one of the very closest to what traditional fashion companies are actually trying to understand, we, uh, not with the data, but you know, definitely based on the human behavior, you know, customer. Uh, so I'm just wondering what, what kind of context you are observing, so what kind of cases that you're observing with the data? So, one, so the two aspects, one of this is, uh, which, which is probably a fundamental problem of uh, fashion or any internet company is annotation. You know, ultimately, uh, date, I'm not able to give it a name to a context, right? And then I could go take it to a stylist and say, that, look, what do you think this one, b b this one represents, right? We can give uh, some annotation and they might come back, look, this is a beach wear or this is a party wear context or this is a more a party dress kind of a context. So there are contexts which, but we are not actually in this process being able to give it a name okay. to the context, right? But, Yes. Depending on the uh, cases, they might look at uh, the behavior on the website exactly. is different, right? Because yes. if I'm looking at a white t-shirt, yes. I'm going to look at white, 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 exactly. white. But if I'm just looking at t-shirts, I yep. might move on to yes. a different type of t-shirt. Yes, yes. Do you observe those? Things? Yeah, and, and I think the use case to this is really, can I present a better navigation okay. For the for navigation solution, right now the navigation solution which we have is more a static presentation. Mm -hmm. Like I really don't change, but really as as other than the recommendation, but you know the, my listings are kind of static. But there is an alternate way of presenting a navigation, which is what we're exploring. But that's exactly right. Okay. You know, uh, it's more data-driven navigation is what we're trying to go towards. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Thank you, Deepak. Thanks. Thanks.